So it's time for In the Reef, episode three now, and guess who's back? Kevin Lacey, buddy. How's it going? Hey, AJ. I'm really uh, excited to be on the on the show again here. <laughs> on uh, your own show? On, yeah, on my own <laughs> show. You know, that helps. I really appreciate all the help that you've uh, given so far, especially in my absence here, because we do want to get this show going pretty regularly. And uh, of course, I was uh, in Europe there for a bit and then immediately went on another vacation. So uh, I know life is hard, right? Must be tough. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, after the month of October has essentially wrapped, uh, the boys have put together a four and three record. Obviously, you'd like it to be a little bit better, but unfortunately, the Ontario Rain are a steamroller right now. So (laughs) for the month of October, uh, what have you been able to see and, uh, you know, who's looking good? Just give me your thoughts on the month. Yeah, you know, as far as what I've been able to see, which has kind of been a little spotty here, um, I I think the biggest surprise uh, I, I don't want to start with the negatives, but I will start with the negatives here. I think the biggest surprise has been that uh, Ivan Shakovich and Sasha Shmulevsky have a combined two points here this month, and Sasha's a minus four. So I'm curious to know what is going on with these two you know, high-profile prospects that – they really thrived in their amateur tryouts over the last two years with the club, right right in the playoff push. But here now with uh, them being full-time members of the club, not really performing, doing okay in training camp, and it's the, the okayness has translated to the, the team. Um, so thankfully some other players have performed, like Joel, Joel Shellman, uh, who is a, a Swedish veteran, uh, playing in North America for the first time. I think Shellman has adapted really nicely. He's leading the team in points right now. Just the one goal, but I believe he's got seven assists. And he's been a face-off machine, which uh, I don't know if you caught the, the Colorado series over the weekend, AJ, but mm-hmm. Colorado was dynamite on face-offs, but Joel Shellman really you know, stood his ground when, when the team needed it. And I think that's why the Barracuda were able to overcome uh, after kind of a disappointing game, first game in Colorado, really took it to him in that second game, made the adjust, adjustments, and uh, I think Shellman led the charge there. Okay, but when you say that gentleman's name, say it so that people know who you're talking about. So if you read his name, <laughs> that's awesome. If you read his name, it's Joel Kelman. Thank but you. the correct Swedish pronunciation is Joel Shellman. So, yeah. Joel Shellman. It's just like Josef Koronash. It makes no sense. But yeah. in the home language, it certainly does. <laughs> yeah, but I guarantee you there are people going, Joel Sh-, Like, they thought that was one name. <laughs> Joel Shellman? <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you. But, yes, he, uh, yeah, leading in points, uh, but a little bit more in, in um, we'll talk about this with uh, Nick Nolenberger, but uh, Bergman, six points in four games, whereas... Uh, you'll show them in eight points in seven games, but hey, <laughs> dudes get say it as one name. <laughs> I'm telling you. So, uh, that, that's what I got to do. Uh, <laughs> but... Yeah, but Leon Bergman, I like that you brought him up though, because he's kind of just, it, it's weird saying like a five tool athlete when you're talking about an AHL player, but he really does bring it all. He's responsible in his own end. He's one of the most physical players on the team and he puts up points. He, Earlier today, we're recording this on Wednesday uh, against Bakersfield, and he had a nice goal. It was mostly Redeem Shimmick on that goal in his rehab assignment. Redeem Shimmick with a heads-up play. I, I actually could see his line of sight on it just from where I was. I had the advantage of where I was sitting. And he saw Bergman, who's right where he should be in front of the net, and deliberately shot it off of Bergman's foot. And it went in, and I'm like, all right, Bergman's going where he needs to be. Shimmick reading plays very nicely. Like, that's what you want to see for these prospects, or in this case for Shimmick, a rehab assignment. Uh, because, you know, the Sharks need the help. We know that. And uh, hopefully it's coming. I don't know if it's the ultimate solution, <laughs> but guys like Bergman and Shimmick are going to be relied on in the future. Yeah. So. Well- and another, uh, you talk about the game that was played today, uh, October 30th. Uh, 
Blickfeld pots to uh, a beautiful feed on the second one from Hobgawax. I mean, yeah. Oof. Yeah, so I I missed that. I need to go back and rewatch that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I was on a site visit at that moment. But Joachim Blickfeld gets his first two goals for the Barracuda this season. And uh, another player, just like Chikovic and Shmolevsky, where there's a lot riding on this prospect. Blickfeld's got an amazing shot. Um, and, and the fact that he was able to use it twice here tonight or today. There it is. There's the tonight <laughs> versus the today. Um, <laughs> but yeah, really good to see. Hopefully Blickfeld gets on a roll. Yeah. Uh, oh God, wouldn't that be amazing? Cause Lord knows the sharks could use some help. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know how much longer Gregor's going to be sticking around. Yeah. Noah Gregor had a, had a nice start here for the Barracuda. And I think, you know, with a lot of these players, you're just going to see, I don't know if any of them are ready for full-time NHL work outside of Shimek, of course. Um, but you, you're going to see a bunch of different faces, I think, shuttling between the two teams this year. I mean, we've already seen Daniel Yurtaikin, um, Noah Gregor, Johnny Brodzinski, Trevor Carrick. I mean, that's all, we're a month into the season. Leon Bergman. So that's already five players that have shuttled back and forth between these two teams. And I think it's going to continue. Auntie Suomela might be another one, although... So far with Sumo, the points, just like last year when he was reassigned to the AHL, the points aren't coming. So I, I don't know what's going on with Sumo, but he's going to have to step it up. Yeah, I could I could see True or Latunov getting a look before Sumo at this point. Yeah, just, definitely. Oof. And, I, you know, I was really high on Alex True going into the season. I thought he would be the 13th forward for the Sharks, but... Uh, he, like some of the other guys, just didn't have a stand out, stand out enough camp to, you know, make that jump. So, but he's worthy of a call up. I, I like his skill set, and of course, the Sharks have to love Alex True's size. No, oh, yeah, big, big boy, big boy. Yeah, uh, and I know uh, we'll talk about it with Nick Nolenberger, but uh, no, the one call up that I'm telling you every Sharks fan wants right now is Cornage. <laughs> 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 Two shutouts. <laughs> in five games, 181 goals against, 932 save percentage. Yeah, we could use that in the big club. <laughs> Definitely. And I, I received a, a tweet. Uh, I'm trying to pull it up here. I believe it was from Illuminato, though, uh, asking me, you know, when do the Sharks decide now's the, you know, to, to pull the trigger? Now's the time to call up Yosef Coronash. My response was, I hope not. I really want Yosef Coronash just to get a full season of AHL experience as a full-time starting goalie because he split the year last year with Antoine Bibo, and they were both great. Um, stats might not show up for Bibo, but he was very good. But uh, happy trails. Yeah. Uh, but Yosef and Coronash so far has really been outstanding. I think both goalies have been very good. Andrew Shortridge has had a nice start to his professional career but Coronash is definitely the guy he's the goalie of the future in this organization and if the Sharks continue to falter as much as I would like to think that they'll keep Coronash and many of these prospects in the minors just to marinate and, and develop uh, no matter how the big club performs the Sharks have been known to pull the trigger on the call-ups, you know, and Cornash might find himself. If the Sharks are struggling by Chris, still by Christmas time, Cornash might be the backup goalie the rest of the season. And take into account, d dude did go to the AHL All-Star game last season. so As, Yeah, absolutely. As a rookie, that's no small feat. So. All right. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, another thing that uh, kind of, I, I shouldn't say, well, uh, you know, we knew somebody, but anyway, Teal Town USA putting it out there that the uh, Barracuda have themselves some new orange threads. Yes, they do. And as you know, I am a huge fan of the orange color scheme for the Barracuda. I just I really like that they're able to use the Sharks identity with the, the jersey style, the jersey pattern, but still make it their own, have their own color, their own brand while keeping it in the family. And I, I'm, I want to know why the, the, the Barracuda haven't made this their primary jersey. That's just my opinion. 
But I, I'd love to see the teal as a, as a the alternate and orange as the primary. And you see fans around the arena all the time. That orange is very identifiable for this team. Most of the fans are clad in orange. I wore my orange to the Barracuda game earlier today. Um, so, yeah, uh, but it, it, it's a great look for them. I like that they went with a new logo or a new crest. Um, I don't know how you feel on this, AJ. I actually am curious to hear everyone's thoughts regarding the crest. But they went without the SJ to kind of differentiate it, this one from the prior rendition. Um, I think it looks very nice. Maybe a little, maybe needs a little more like accenting around the collar or something like that. But I think overall, it's a good looking jersey. Yeah, I, I could uh, appreciate if they added the, uh, the 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 two draw lines across the neck. It seems yeah. the replica, which is all we've seen so far, that part does look kind of bland. I think yeah. they could make the crest a scotch bigger. It seems I agree. I definitely agree with you there because I feel like because of the shape of the crest, I think it exposes the lack of design on the rest of the jersey more. Mm -hmm. Um. So, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I, I'm curious. I haven't seen it in person. And I'm very much the, the the type of person who complains about a jersey online. And then when I see it in person, I go, so, OK, oh. actually, that's pretty cool. You know, so. <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to be interested to, to see what it looks like when they actually wear these. Uh, we know that the uh, orange jersey night on November 23rd is likely to be one of the first ones we see. Um the other thing, though, that I kind of wonder about, because I do like the idea of the Barracuda having more of their own identity rather yes. than wearing the same colors. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when the Barracuda first came here five years ago, weren't both clubs wearing Reeboks? No, the AHL has a uh, license with CCM. Mm -hmm. So even though, and in even now, even though the jerseys or unis are similar to the Adidas. They still are made by manufactured by CCM. Um, so CCM has basically just remodeled, repatterned the jerseys uh, previously Reebok. Now Adidas, uh, it is, um, it, it's an exclusive contract. Uh, you're, you're looking at helmets, uh, gear sticks. The only, the only non CCM, equipment that you'll see at the EHL are for players who have uh, private licensing deals. So, ah, well, that yeah. makes sense. See, yeah. for some reason I had it, I mean, I knew that CCM was doing it now, but for some reason I thought I had it in my mind, like the first or second year they were both Reebok. And cause I remember talking to somebody about it going, well, w we had the, a similar conversation. Like, why don't they have their own design? And we were kind of like, well, you have to admit they're saving a lot of money. If, if, Reebok, if Reebok's doing both of these, you know. <laughs> this is ringing a bell, but I know that ultimately it was still CCM. There, the, you're, you're not wrong on this, but I don't remember the exact details on what happened with Reebok there. Yeah. Well, either way, uh, it should be fun to see uh, the, the, how these jerseys perform out on the ice. I, I look forward to seeing them. Uh, the, again, maybe the crest will be a little bit bigger on the – if they actually sell authentics of these, which at this point we have not seen, but uh, we, we we can all hope. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I, I love the collars of the CCMs, by the way. The teal yeah. and whites. Yeah. I yeah. Love, I love the that kind of pattern that they have on there. It just It pops for me, but... <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, we know that uh, between now and the next show, uh, boy, it's one hell of a litmus test for the Barracuda this Friday against Stockton. I mean, Stockton's number one right now. They're killing it in their division. I think they uh, lead the league with 33 goals. Um, they're not having a problem burying them, and, and their goalie's doing, is it Giles? Is that correct? Uh, Gillies. Gillies. And the crazy thing about this with Stockton is this is what I expected last year out of this club. Like, I'm very high on John Gillies to maybe not necessarily be an NHL starter, but just be an NHL goalie. And he's been with Stockton for years now. Um, 
when the the Barracuda and the Heat played in the playoffs a few years ago, Gillies was the goalie with David Riddick platooning. And Gillies is still here. Riddick's with the big club. Um, but, yeah, just all around, this team has been far superior to last year's. Uh, they've revamped. They've gotten younger. I think that's part of it. Um, but uh, of course they got my guy, Buddy Robinson. I love me some Buddy Robinson, uh, but Matt Phillips is definite. Matthew Phillips is definitely, uh, a force for that team. And it's, it's going to be a good test. I mean, you, you need tests along the way. You can't just steamroll teams like San Diego who are zero and six, for example, like you, you're gonna, if you want to be a true contender, you have to go up against real competition. And, uh, I'd like to see the Barracuda, you know, improve against Ontario, um, who <laughs> actually only have one fewer loss. Actually, no, they have the same record as Stockton. Uh, they both are 6-1-1. One, and one. Um, and could but, have unfortunately given them 10 goals in two games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the best way right now to respond to that is, hey, Stockton's just as good. Let's go out and beat them. All right, well, uh, we're going to get back at you in a couple weeks uh, after games against Stockton, Tucson, Bakersfield, and San Diego. Hopefully we'll be able to throw in episode four in between uh, those two San Diego games. And uh, it, it'll you can determine yourself if we will keep it classy. <laughs> well, thanks for having me uh, back on my own show, AJ. <laughs> I, I look forward yeah. to when you're hosting. <laughs> but yes, let's let's get to Nick because that's who everyone wants to hear from. So yeah. <laughs> All right, and welcome to another episode of In the Reef. Here we are once again joined by the voice of the San Jose Barracuda, Nick Nolenberger. Uh, after today, you got to be feeling a little bit better about where things are headed. Yeah, absolutely. It's back to back shutout victories. You pick up a big one on the road in Colorado, which is always a hostile environment, and then you come back this morning and. You pick up a 5 nothing shutout win in front of a, a couple thousand kids and an 11 a.m. start. So I think everybody with the team, with the staff, is feeling pretty good where the group is at and just kind of where, where the players are gelling. You know, you never know with as many young players as you have every year in the AHL and how quick it's going to take for them to mesh. But it's taken a couple weeks. We're into, into the season now by a month. So, you know, it seems like it's starting to come together and it's coming together uh, – pretty pretty well too so you get back-to-back shutouts never a bad thing no not at all and to catch everybody up uh when we did speak a couple of weeks ago the barracuda started off two and one since then they could have played four games including a another loss to those pesky ontario rain uh (laughs) split that series in colorado with the eagles and then today as nick mentioned picking up a second straight shutout for cornash and a 5-0 walk over the oilers affiliate the bakersfield condors so after starting the season with the Sharks, Bergman was sent to the CUDA and has since picked up three goals and three assists over the last four games. Uh, perhaps even more impressive, Bergman's three goals are on eight shots. What can you tell us that you've seen from him, and uh, how many more games do you think he'll be available for Sommer at this point? <laughs> I don't think very very much longer. The only thing that I think is limiting him from going up at this point is just you know a log jam at the forward position. It doesn't mean that he couldn't, be up as early as Friday. I mean, I could I could see him being in the lineup as early as Friday if if they decide to go that route. But you know, he's been he's been dominant so far since he's been down. He's a bit, you know he's not an overly tall guy, but he's physical. He, he's a you know a hound on the puck. Um, he wants to throw the body. He wants to have a physical element to his game. But he's also extremely skilled. Um, and at just 21 years of age, another guy that the Sharks were able to find in their scouting staff. Give him credit. As an undrafted player, a little bit under the radar, but last year he went back to his native Germany and he played in the German League out there and he had 20 goals. I think he had nine nine assists for 29 points. He was the only player under 20 to score 20 goals. And, you know, he's coming out to North America expecting to probably play and start in the American Hockey League where he puts together a great training camp, plays six games up to the big club and now down in in the American League kind of continuing to hone his game. And he's done everything you could ask so far in his four games i want to say he has six points now he's got uh yep. you know goals in three straight games so um he has been dominant been a certainly a nice addition into the lineup and um i would expect him to probably hear his name recalled in the very near future now again does he play friday to be determined just because of some depth 
But, man, he has been very, very impressive so far in his short stint in the American Hockey League. Well, let's talk about another player who began the season with the Sharks. Uh, you're tanking. Uh, in only three games with the Cuda, he has no points and is leading the team not the way you want to at a minus six. What do you think's going on there? Uh, he didn't play today, and I don't know if it was a, a healthy scratch or if he's got some nagging injuries. I, I think for a guy like your Tykin, there's still a big learning curve. He's a younger player. He spent last year in the KHL, which is considered a very good international league out in Russia. You know, he's still dealing with some language barriers. He has Yevgeny Nabokov doing all his translating right now. So, you know, he's coming in and he has the coaches telling him something and then it's got to go through to Bokov, which, you know, I'm sure Navi's doing a great job in translating, but there's some disconnect there. And I think there's a lot of adjustment for him. They liked how he played in training camp. That's the reason why he made the big club out of training camp. He's a physical player. He's got some skill, but it's going to be a learning curve for him. So, you know, I think sometimes people expect a guy, especially if he makes the NHL out of training camp, that he's going to come to the AHL and dominate, you know, some guys do. You see a Bergman, and that's the case right now. Other guys takes a little bit longer. I don't think your Tyken is going to take too long. But, again, he's got to get used to the smaller playing surface. He's got to get used to new teammates, used to the, you know, the travel, the busing, some flying. So there's an adjustment period that some players adjust to quicker than others. But I'm not concerned that he won't be a good player down, down the line. But right now he's still developing, and I think he's still a prospect and sometimes – just that I think, you know, people got to take it slow with him because he's still learning, you know, what it's like to be a pro here in North America, adjusting to the smaller surface, adjusting to the language. Um, I would expect he'd be with us for, you know, a couple more weeks at this point and see if he can find a rhythm. But um, you just got to think going to a different country with a different organization, having, you know, your goalie coach translating the system. Um, I think he's just trying to learn the system at this point. So, once he gets that, then he can start playing without having to think so much, and I think everything will start to fall in place for him. Well, we both know Nabokov can show him how to score. I mean, he's got a goal. So <laughs> I think Nabby at this point in his career, because he hasn't played goal in about 10 years, he thinks he's a forward now. He w- refuses to put the goalie equipment on. He's always shooting to get the goalies warm. Um, I think he thinks he could have played forward um, if, if he could go back in his career. Nice. <laughs> Well, uh, we know Radim Shimik is now on a conditioning assignment with the CUDA. Uh, played his last game, or um, played his first game today since his injury last March versus the Jets. Funnily enough, of course, the Jets coming to town this weekend. Uh, but Shimmick got an assist today uh, on the fifth goal, finished at a plus one along with a couple blocks. Uh, how do you think he looked, and how long do you think he'll uh, need to be conditioned before he makes his way back? It's going to be interesting on what they decide. I mean, I mentioned Bergman could be with the big club as early as Friday. I know, you know, with the way things are playing out right now, there's this expectation to maybe rush him. I I don't expect them to do that. Now, will he play with the Barracuda on Friday or play with the Sharks to be determined? But, you know, he's as solid as you could ask for today. I spoke to him after the game. He said he felt good, you know, from what you could take from his broken English. Uh, But he said he felt good. He said, yeah, he was a little nervous. He did admit that going into the game, just, you know, as anybody would be having not played for as long as he has. Um, But I thought he was solid. I mean, that, you know, he went back to his own end. He defended well. Uh, He blocked a couple shots. Um, You mentioned he had the assist was a plus one. Um, not the flashiest player. I think Sharks realized that last year, but he's steady Eddie. And, um, once he's ready to go, it's going to be exciting to get him back in the lineup. Obviously last year he had instant chemistry, you know, with Brent Burns. So that would be the dream for him to come back and it'd be a seamless transition back into that. So far, so good. I think that was about as good of a debut as you could ask for. Um, and it's the nice privilege of having your AHL team in the same city as, you can get him a couple games before you know he tests the water at the NHL level. Absolutely. Uh, finally, it's no secret the Sharks are having some issues in net with Jones and Dell. Uh, you know, finish. I think right now they're in the ranked in the mid forties. It's not looking good. Meanwhile, Cornish two shutouts in five games, one eighty one goals against, nine thirty two save percentage. Only two goalies in the AHL right now have more than one shutout. He's one of them. In comparable stats, only Cal Peterson of the Ontario Reign is posting better numbers. What's the key for Cornash, and do you think the Sharks maybe even take a look at him? I mean, I think eventually maybe that would be a possibility, but it's not any time close. Uh, you know, you, you look at the goaltending position, I think you got to equate it a lot in football with a quarterback that's struggling, 
before you just throw everything on the quarterback, you got to make sure the O line is secure. And that's the same situation that's going on with the Sharks. I mean, I, I, you know, from what I've seen from my vantage point, you know, they've got to sure up the decor. There's still a lot of moving pieces. You've got Mario Ferraro, who's a young kid that just finished up two years in college and he's jumped right in there. Now, has he played good? Yeah. But, you know, you've got new pieces in there. There's no more Justin Braun. You're still working through the kinks with Eric Carlson coming off a major injury. You know, I think it's a combination of a lot of things, you know, and with Martin Jones and Aaron Dell, both of them have played well at times. Yeah. Uh, it's easy for them to be the scapegoat. I think in, in, especially in hockey, we look at the goaltending position right away and we, we want to blame the goalies, but the way Cornish is playing, it's exciting. I think it makes the organization excited, but the mission and the, the thought process this year is to let Cornish continue to get a lot of games because before last year, he went back to the Czech Republic, played in what is considered their second tier league and didn't really play it a ton. Now, last year, he split with Antoine Bebo as the two goalies, so he played roughly 30 or so games. You know, they want him to get a, a heavy dose in the American Hockey League and continue to develop. He's just 21 years of age. Now, you've seen young goalies come in. I, you look at a, a Matt Murray in Pittsburgh. I think he was 21 when he won his first cup. So it's possible for young guys to come in and play well. Unless there was an injury, I would be shocked at this stage in the season that they would make any sort of rash decision to, to try to have Coronash get in with a big club. Now, I know fans are, are asking, you know, what's, you know, what's the deal with these young goalies developing? But at this stage, you know, continue to let him gain confidence in the American League level. And hopefully, as things settle down, you won't need him this year. And I think that's the mission and the goal of the organization is you've got two NHL caliber goalies. Things aren't going the right way right now. you got a young guy you don't want to throw to the Wolves right away. Let him continue to develop, gain confidence in the American League, and then maybe a couple years down the road, down the road even next year, you know, Dell will be a free agent. You know, we'll see what happens, you know, with the entire situation. But next year, you look to him for him to make that next leap and become an NHLer. Yeah. Well, of course, yeah, everybody looking at the St. Louis situation last year with Bennington. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. We did get a power pour today, courtesy of Blechfeld's power play marker in the first period. Um, of course, we're going to check back uh, with you in a couple weeks after games versus Stockton, which should be a huge test with what's going on with them. Then Tucson, Bakersfield, and San Diego. The game on Sunday, November 3rd against Tucson, is the Hockey Fights Cancer game. The following Sunday, November 10th, Military Appreciation Night. Uh, you want to let us know what's going on in both of those? Yeah, absolutely. So this Sunday is our first Hockey Fights Cancer Night in which we're going to be wearing specialty jerseys. And you can bid on those jerseys during and after the game. We'll have selected jerseys that we put up for auction, but you can also bid on them while the game is going on. So you can find out all the information by going to sjbarracuda.com slash promotions. Get all the details on how you can get your hands on one of those jerseys. They're really sweet. They're the lavender color to support um, hockey fights cancer that you know it seems like the whole world of hockey has jumped on board that's this sunday three o'clock against tucson and it's a tucson team that is rolling so it should be a really good game as well um again you can go to sjbarracuda.com slash promotions jerseys are really awesome it's to a great cause the money goes um to charity and, and helps out with uh you know the fight towards cancer so those are the, the upcoming things going on right now and you know we got 408 night coming up as well i don't know if you heard but joey chestnut Matt Stoney will be in the tank. They'll be eating waffles eight minutes, see how many they can eat. You know, the, the waffle is invented in San Jose, so it all ties into the into the 408 night. So um, nice. lots of fun promotions. Again, if you want the full list, go to sjbarracuda.com slash promotions, and you can see the list of, of stuff we got on tap for the, for the remainder of the season. Well, and we uh, also, speaking of which, noticed – some new orange threads at Solar for America Ice. And uh, is that in preparation for Orange Jersey Day on the 23rd? Well, we're going to wear them like we've worn them in the past. Where you, I, I think we've worn them on Fridays at home on the second half of the year. So um, once the American Hockey League season hits the halfway point of the year, you switch from wearing yep. your white jerseys to wearing dark at home. So we'll begin to wear the orange ones, I think, in the second half of the year. Um, good to see the orange back on a full-time basis. Last year we wore them once. Um, in the years past, we wore them as an alternate uniform. So this year, that's what we're going to do. Or we'll, we will wear them on a more consistent basis. And it's got an alternative logo on the chest. It doesn't. It's not encapsulated um, by the SJ. It's just kind of a floating um, Barracuda logo. So something different. 
um, something that we haven't done before. So it's kind of fun to use a different logo. And if you get to see the orange, they certainly, uh, they certainly pop. That's for sure. Of course. Uh, and then we actually had one question that came in for you, uh, wanting to know what the response has been to this season embracing the whole digital broadcast. Yeah, I think for most people, there was some frustration when they go to listen to the games um, from a Barracuda standpoint. We were on KDOW, um, which is a business station, and they're based out of Fremont, but their signal really wasn't very good south of San Jose. Plus, because, you know, we're an American Hockey League team in a major top 10 market. When you hit weekdays and it's drive time and it's big time minutes on the radio, sometimes we weren't on. So we'd have certain games that we were on the radio. Most of them were, I think we're about 90%, but some weren't. So people would be like, where's the game? Where's the game now? It's a one-stop shop. You can go to our website or you can use the Sharks Plus SAP Center app. And it's kind of where radio is going, unfortunately, for traditionists, even for a guy like myself who you know grew up on the radio. It's a little hard to see it go, but it's the wave of the future. It's where it's at. Everything's streaming nowadays, so we're just trying to kind of follow the trend, and hopefully we'll get to a point where we've got so much content out that people can listen to Barracuda and Sharks content on a full-time basis. So that's the goal. That's where we're trying to get to, um, and so far I think uh, it's been pretty uh, streamlined, so I've enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us for this check-in with the CUDA, and we will see you again in a couple weeks. Sounds good. Appreciate it.